going to go away. <laughs> uh, I think that's it. Wonderful organization. Jim, I'm glad you brought up the, the carry out dine in because I want to steal the idea. Talk about how we're, <laughs> we're learning stuff from organizations. I was like, oh, that's a good, that's a good thing to try. I wonder, I do wonder how successful it is because it seems clever. Nice. All right. Then go ahead and score if there are no other comments. All right, all the scores are in. Okay. Moving now to uh, Shake Rag Alley in Mineral Point. And Carrie, this is you again. It is me again, and we're still on the western side of the state. Um, Shake Rag Alley Center for the Arts. If you ever want to know what Shake Rag means, I will let you know, but not now. Um, so this is a nonprofit school of arts and crafts founded in 2004 by local artists and community members. Uh, it has a national presence, so it's it's community based, but it also draws in um, artists and students from from elsewhere. Um, beyond Wisconsin even. So it's a national destination for those looking to participate in adult arts and crafts workshops. And it has a robust summer youth program. And um, it also has 2.5 acres. And they, they use those grounds um, for uh, meetings and events. And they have individual garden beds uh, that are available that are taken care of by the master gardeners. That's some of the uh, more unique programming it's able to provide. Last year, it served a small, so it, it provides really deep experiences for the participants um, that they reach. So last year was 542 adults and 110 children. The, the it really, the application does indicate that it had both new program ideas and that they were able to adapt into the, the program, the, excuse me, the pandemic era. And it is an era. Um, some of the new programming is the Driftless Poets Workshop and a Monarch Butterfly Way Station. What better time to introduce an outdoor activity, but, but this year, so that worked well. Um, they also had a, a launched a big read program before the pandemic and was still able to to uh, realize it. Um, the narrative does indicate that it was more challenging than they anticipated it being. Um, and that's one of the um, points they make in the narrative when it comes to where they're looking at their strengths and weaknesses is that the, the quality of programming is there and, uh, and they're able to do a lot of things, but the leadership is and the board is really um, having some challenges as far as the demands and so there's the threat is leadership burnout that is mentioned within the narrative um and so this is more backward looking than forward looking but that's something that's going to have to be addressed down the road but not at this time it, the organization also actively engages in youth programming um so local youth programming their adult programming brings in adults uh, from elsewhere and so the, what the narrative isn't as clear on is the impact it has on the local adult population um, and how they're able to connect with them. Um, they have a solid marketing plan and they're developing a new programming identifying community needs with a new strategic plan. And that's what I have in my notes. All right, thank you. Adalia? Yeah, um, I don't have a whole much, a lot to add, but I, again, appreciate their emphasis on natural resources and they really focusing on local crafts and artisans. Um, they said they converted, successfully converted 75% of their youth program workshops into art kits um, that were available curbside or mail. Um, they, they really emphasize um, the importance of their presence like in schools, um, really providing students with mental health breaks um, and kind of um, combating that isolation and virtual fatigue. Um, 
He said they have long-term stakeholders and donors. Um, look like they had good curriculum planning, um, factoring in student and instructor feedback. Um, and yeah, it looked like it was a solid marketing plan with um, Prince Digital and mailing with community events. Um, Thank you. All right, other comments? Seems to be a nice balance of um, uh, community engagement uh, and and uh, and its year-round uh, community folk, uh, programming, but also um, bringing in um, instructors that would have national attention to draw people to the community as um, an economic boon to those that that smaller rural area of Wisconsin that is so beautiful and rolling, but <laughs> uh, otherwise uh, quiet. So um, that's that's kind of nice to see. I, I think there's a nice um, integrated community commitment to uh, build quality programs and, and attract participants um, uh, from outside the area to appreciate that aspect of, of Wisconsin too. All right, Lindsay or Jim? Um, I just have two little highlights to add to it in that um, I they mentioned hosting a dinner to gather other nonprofits in the community to unite. Um, and I thought that that was a really thoughtful thing to do. And um, also, I don't maybe somebody else already mentioned this, but um, if, if they did, it's worth mentioning again that their work with the schools this year um, to help support mental health issues because of the pandemic um, and you know, we all know art is great for that. So I thought that was a great collaboration. To follow my usual theme, this is an organization that shares my fear for the debt load that the buildings are uh, are imposing on them. Uh, but the buildings are the are are the, the reason for the for the organization to exist. So uh, it's it's once again we're in we're in irony uh, land. But I would have liked. Uh, for that reason, I would have liked a bit more discussion of the structure of their finances. They have so many different kinds of programs. Which ones are generating their revenue? Um, and and are there are there opportunities for them to expand some of those, uh, or do they new, have to find new revenue generators? What's the what's the balance on those things? Uh, that kind of discussion would have been would have been helpful even to know that they were that they were having that kind of discussion uh i think would have been helpful um for a second they are the key driver of the creative economy in the area and those are my comments thank you all right if there are no other comments please go ahead and score All the votes are in. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, move to Monroe, Wisconsin at the uh, Monroe Arts Center. Lindsay, please start us off. All right, the Monroe Arts Center's mission is threefold, to nurture an appreciation for the arts, to aid individual creative development, and to ensure the preservation and integrity of historic facility. Uh, so they typically would have um, eight classical concerts, three free family shows, and I, I've had a question mark here, approximately 14 other shows. Maybe I was adding them up. Um, a summer concert series, six in-school shows, 12 exhibits, art classes. So like several others that we've talked about today, they're really doing a, a nice variety of programming on a very small budget. Um, COVID hit and everything got canceled, of course another familiar story um, but the remaining staff um, tried to stay as connected to the community as possible they did host some outdoor concerts they opened up their galleries by appointment they did some live streams some virtual classes 
Um, so a good variety of options still. Um, they have partnered with their schools and then also with the Monroe Clinic in a Art Heals program. They are, they were, and then COVID hit, but they're still working on um, a partnership with their middle school after school program. Um, so it, it'll be exciting to see how that evolves over the years. Uh, and they collaborate with other nonprofits to share their resources. Sounds like they have a strong, very focused board. They are working on educating board staff and members on diversity and equity. They are working on a school of music program for underserved audiences, expanding reach with more virtual content. Um, they mentioned that they are, they contact their local leaders. Um, and then I wanted to just highlight their building inclusive communities exhibit that they um, worked with the Madison street artists um, from May of 2020 when there was the graffiti art. And so um, I thought that that was a great example of um, reacting to an opportunity um, that's also of uh, importance right now and, and using art to um, connect us all. Um, I, again, uh, as, a, as a weakness or comment, the, the budget summary does not match the 990 numbers for this organization. They mentioned that they are working on um, a new sustainability plan. I did not notice that a strategic plan was included, but um, they explained that they didn't include one because they said it's not applicable because of COVID. Um, and I, I, I guess I would have still liked to see uh, something um, or what they are what they are working on instead, or how maybe their strategic plan changed because of COVID. Um, so any of those options. Um, then only let's see. Um, and then this is also a smaller thing, but since one of the things that we're um, reviewing is the 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 quality or the, that the correct people are involved in everything, um, and so I've noticed this not only this is the first time I think I'm bringing it up, but in a few other organizations, um, I did mention it in my comments to them, but. Um, sometimes they just list retired as their board occupation, and I have found it interesting and helpful to know what a person is retired from, just to see what their background might be and how diverse a board is. Um, and so I noticed in this one also that a, a, several of the board members were just listed as retired, so it's a little hard to get a sense of what um, they bring to the table. Thank you, Lindsay. All right, Jan. Okay. Um, thanks, Lindsay. That's that's pretty thorough. I don't have a whole lot to add, but um, just that being a small organization, um, it seems like it's tried to um, really hard to position itself as a regional destination um, and uh, has has grown its arts programming uh, to really be an integral fabric for the community and um, try to respond to the needs. I, I think that uh, clinic program, if they can get that off the ground uh, after COVID is a, a nice partnership. Um, their uh, outreach of performing arts and youth classes on site um, sounded like they were well attended and I hope those can pick up again uh, uh, down the road. Um, that, that effort at uh, growing diversity and inclusion, particularly in that part of the state uh, is uh, a real positive to insert into their programming and, and that um, partnership with Madison. Um, it looks like they were able to um, pivot fairly successfully to do offer some virtual programs um, and, and um, something that could result in a positive skill for them to continue in the future. And I think a lot of organizations are discovering that. Um, for me, it's personally fun to kind of look at this organization because I was the uh, 20 hour a week director uh, in uh, 1983. Um, <laughs> as one of the only staff members at that point in time. <laughs> So um, it's fun to take a look at uh, where people have gone and, and how this has grown in, in a community and and well nurtured um, pairs. Um, I felt it was unfortunate there wasn't something more 
recent in a strategic plan that was available and would have liked to have seen um, that broader scope. I know they've um, added on to the building. They've, they've certainly um, uh, tried to do some, some um, future uh, outlook because of that. Um, and it's a, and part of what I say is, is not only is there um, building concern to take a look at, but um, and, and management of that, but such a small staff and large number of programs that they're attempting as well as the, the additional outreach um, starts to look at a recipe for burnout again down the road. So we just try to take a look at those those aspects and uh, be cautious. So I have nothing else. Jan, do you, do you remember uh, what the date was on that uh, strategic plan? Uh, I didn't make a note of that. Uh, I'll go in and look. That's OK, I'll go in and look. OK, uh, thank you. Other voices? Um, Karen, I don't think they I specific like I wrote that they didn't include a strategic plan because they explained it wasn't applicable. Uh, oh, yes. I, yeah, having I'm sorry that having a strategic plan wasn't applicable because of COVID. The current strategic plan that they had been using wasn't applicable because COVID made change that so much what their goals were. Yeah, I, I have been just even um, as a suggestion, a previous plan or something like that would have been helpful to see how they um, had come to where they are and and or using some additional visitor feedback forms um, with examples of how they gather input to make their decisions. Well, and the plan that they operated uh, under during the last two and a half or so years during the which is what they're talking about within their narrative, given that this is a retroactive retrospective grant. OK, thank you. Um, other other comments on this one. I know there are some. OK, Dan. Uh, I, I don't know whether I'm trying to be polite or trying to get the last word in this. In, in this. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of both. Anyway, um, I would have appreciated a more robust conversation about surprise. Their financial results. Um, they their uh, income was inflated in the middle year that they reported. Was that a capital gift that funded the accessibility renovations that they talked about? Uh, and uh, and for the other two years. Do they plan a deficit knowing that their investment revenue is going to cover it? Or is that uh, or, or, or when when you see a pattern like that, you you it starts to make you want it starts to make me wonder. And I would love some more commentary about um, about financial results, um, even if they don't uh, change by 20 percent. Um, another. Let me just look here for a second and see if there's something else here. I do appreciate the uh, the inclusivity initiative. I think that is uh, that is terrific uh, for an organization uh, in a community uh, in a community similar to theirs. Uh, I would be interested to learn more about what their outreach to diverse communities looks like. I think that's it. Um, I agree with what's been said. They had a curious statement in one of their sections. I think it was organizational financial management. Yeah, it was. They said that they were they had let go of the old ways um, and just left it there. And I can see why you might want to, but perhaps you wouldn't want to necessarily say that. <laughs> Explain. I just it left me wondering what does what does that mean? <laughs> I mean, I can make my own meeting, and I don't think that's what they want me to do. <laughs> but, but other than that, I mean, I, I find the applicant to be a good uh, neighbor, a good community partner um, in Monroe. And uh, uh, some nice programming, really good programming. Thank you. I, I thought that you, their use of the phrase thought leadership, that they were that they were trying to uh, establish themselves in a position of thought leadership in the community was was a telling one. We've reached time on this one. 
I would I would then just add that um, uh, it's a it's telling to me as well that I can't remember whether we overtly say because we used to, but I don't know that we do anymore. Um, that the the strategic plan is it's okay to just you know be the old one if it's not the current one you're working on the previous one. And you know once upon a time that was very clear in the guidelines. The guidelines have shifted over time. So um, I will just say that it's very possible that um, that piece of information is not clear um, within our uh, guidelines and the support material instructions. So I will make sure that it is clear for next time, but this time I, I don't know that it was clear. So, all right, please comment or score, and then uh, we will head on to the next one. All the scores are in. Okay. We are going to go back to Milwaukee for um, uh, Latino Arts and their application. And Adalia, you're the lead on this one. Thank you. Um, so their mission statement, they strive to present art at a level of excellence and distinction, connecting communities through artistic expression. Um, they say that it's their core belief that arts education is an important avenue um, to promote trust and dialogue among diverse groups of people. So they focus on really fostering their devel development with southeastern Wisconsin residents, um, but they also want to establish themselves in a more regional audience and regional presence. presence. Um, they have 50 events annually, um, music, art exhibits, and workshops. Um, I wanted to highlight their Latino Arts String Program. Um, one that they specifically mentioned um, in the 2019-2020 season uh, was their seventh annual um, Latino Arts String Program Youth Guitar Festival and Concert. Um, because they said it was the only regional classical guitar competition um, for youth specifically. And um, they had a performance um, where youth award winners, they got to uh, with internationally acclaimed and featured soloist. Um, they say they provide high quality, low cost, and accessible arts programming. Uh, they have one full time staff member, um, an 11 member board. I think it's really incredible uh, the programming that they can do with that um, size of staff and board. Um, they have collaborations with UW Milwaukee and Marquette University. Uh, they also have grant writing support from the United Community Center. And they have had virtual activities, again, pivoting with the pandemic. Um, one of their goals is to see um, their patrons leaving with greater appreciation for diversity and artistic contributions, um, specifically from Hispanics and Latinos, um, you know, historically, but also present day um, on a local and international um, viewpoint. Again, focusing on that trust and social connectedness. Um, and they have a large growth in their Instagram and Facebook following throughout this year, showing that um, they're really changing their efforts to um, digital platforms. Um, they focus on cultural context, really engaging local community artists and leaders. Um, the materials are offered in Spanish and English. Uh, in their annual strategic strategy plan, um, the artistic director leads, um, but also works with the board collaboratively and with community artists. Uh, they really incorporate surveys, dialogues, um, teacher and performer evaluations, and um, interactions and engagements they receive from Facebook. Um, they also have themed programming, and they said that that really um, deepens engagement because it goes into culture um, with Hispanic Heritage Month um, and Dia de los Muertos for another example. Um, they, their marketing is listed in the Portal Wisconsin website. Um, brochures are available to print. Um, looks like they're all PDFs and they're really color print, colorful, vibrant, and showcase variety in programming. That's all. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, Carrie. I just realized I, I mean, I knew I was the secondary person, but I just realized again, like, oh, I've got to speak next. OK, um, <laughs> so sorry. No I was thinking on that one. 
Um, uh, so other than what Adalia has said, um, the, the organization discusses being able to provide a space that, um, where people can have an open dialogue um, about and experience art. And so um, and, and looking at that and thinking about it, I was curious as to, well, pushing them a little bit further, like how how is that dialogue started? Who starts a dialogue? And so um, wanting to hit, know more about that. Um, how often does planning take place? It is being directed by the managing artistic director. So just asking that question and then noticing um, in the work samples. Um, that it would have been helpful to the application to show more variety. So visually there is a better sense of the scope um, that they're able to offer for programmatically. And I'm looking at more carefully at other initiatives they've taken over the last couple of years and then quantifying it. You know, are there more performances, attendees? What are the different outreach you've done, they've done? Um, look, asking that to be addressed more, more clearly within the narrative. Those are the, the big, the big comments. Thank you. All right, others, please. Here's a statement that deserves uh, that deserves a standing ovation. Um, we recognize the value and importance of artists to our community. Therefore, we have paid artists for yes. canceled events. That bespeaks an integrity that is that is incredible in the not-for-profit arts world, and uh, and it, it deserves as as, as much. Uh, it, it deserves being highlighted in, in a very strong way. Um, I, li I like a lot of the things that they said about uh, uh, what what constitutes a successful season and, uh, and other things. I just want to look one more place. Nope, that was what I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Just general, I think it's a you know, such a vibrant, exciting um, contribution to the city of Milwaukee, um, focusing in on this heritage. And and um, I, I look at these organizations sometimes and and wonder you know, how uh, how many more people within the city take advantage of these and and really hope that um, they're out there screaming that they're there and. Uh, um, people uh, take notice because they're they're doing incredible things. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add other than I, I echo that um, uh, that the paying the artists blew me away. I mean, that's that is impressive and really shows how much they care about their artists, um, even. Even though they're the organization itself is going to have a hard year, so uh, very impressed with that. Um, very impressed with the strings program, and then looking at that and based on some of the supporting documents, it looks like the Tino Arts works with youth in many other ways as well. And so, um, I'd love to know more about that in these applications. Um, to, so, so brag a little bit more, I think. Okay. Well, if there are no other comments, please go ahead and score. Okay, we got them all. All right, next we have Arts for All Wisconsin, and it's Jim. All righty, Arts for All Wisconsin. 
uh, founded in 1985 as Very Special Arts Wisconsin, which was this state's affiliate of a program that's now housed in the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in D.C. Um, Very Special Arts is based on, let's see, uh, is to expand the capabilities, confidence, and quality of life for children and adults with disabilities by providing programs in dance, drama, creative, and visual arts. We are unique among all other arts organizations in providing statewide, in-depth, comprehensive programming across the full spectrum of arts activities and disabilities. The participants served by Arts for All Wisconsin cross all disability categories, including physical, emotional, and behavioral, and cognitive. They give 40 art classes and workshops to a number of different folks, uh, 40 arts programs at schools, five community choirs, 12 plus exhibitions, six of them in Madison, five to eight around the state, 20, in 21 municipalities, 12 counties, reaching 1,700 individuals, 300 of whom are children. Uh, there are five full-time staff, 30 contracted teaching artists, 70 volunteers, and seven board members. And their program is now being, um, is now having influence and, and partnering with in some ways. Uh, the implementation of another Kennedy Center program, which is the Any Given Child Initiative, integrating the arts into public school curricula. Uh, and the executive director of uh, Arts for All Wisconsin is sitting on the advisory committee of that implementation team. Uh, and that there's a there's a nice cross pollination going on um, with that in that uh, area. Let's see. Um, all you get the two things that they that they feel that um, or the things that they feel that people get from this program. They feel it's important is that all you get access to the educational, social, psychological, and spiritual value of the art, uh, that there is an impact on the artists themselves in terms of their own self-awareness, in terms of their sense of self-worth, and they gave some nice examples of that. They have a set of comprehensive feedback tools that are both quantitative and qualitative, and they, uh, and they engage in that uh, evaluation process with the teachers, the participants, the parents if it's a child, the caregivers or partners of the uh, of the participants as well. Um, it seems to be, uh, to use the words of, a, of an earlier grant application, 365 degree evaluation. Um, let's see. It's unique, important work. And um, on their on their financial page, there was uh, I, I could not figure out whether their in kind support was the donations of facilities in the communities that they that they give these programs in. I know that they do have, that, that they do request and receive donation of facilities for the teachers to meet with their clients um, in, in the areas around the state that they serve. Uh, so I was wondering how that was reflected on their, uh, on their financials, whether that was the in-kind. It would have been helpful. Once again, uh, with, with in-kind in particular, that's another area where explanation would be helpful. Thank you. A good point for us to, to point out, maybe a little more clearly in the guidelines too, but yes, awesome. I'll try to remember that one. All right, Lindsay, you're next. Thank you, Jim. That was a great summary. I don't have a lot to add to it. Um, I just want to, obviously the work that they're doing is phenomenal and um, I haven't seen a lot of other organizations doing this kind of work, so it's very ne it's necessary that they're, that we have them here to do it. Um, and that the pandemic has caused challenges for most organizations, um, and we've been celebrating, which we should, the pivoting to virtual or other learning, which is great, but for an organization like this, just simply shifting things to virtual in some format is just a little more difficult. And so I think it's wonderful that they were able to do that. They talk about using a guest LMS program, which I'm not aware of, but um, sounds like it's a program put in place to help reduce some barriers um, that can exist with virtual learning. Um, so I did want to 
um, praise that. And again, echo the their work with the Any Given Child program, which I was not very familiar with, but sounds like it's such a big win for the organization to have an executive director be a representative for that group. Um, this number might not be accurate, but I thought there's only 27 representatives around the nation. And so for her to be one of them is, um, with, we're very lucky in Wisconsin to have her here and um, doing that. And I, I also had the questions about some of the budget. Um, I, I didn't understand what some of the deficits were, and then I didn't see that the budget summary matched the 990s. So um, some more explanation there would be helpful. Um, yeah, and then I guess I, besides already um, having unique mission supporting people with disabilities, they're also working on topics that are important as well. Um, I don't know how I saw this, but I, it was a, maybe one of their supporting materials that linked to their website and saw that they have a Black Lives Matter series that they're working on. And um, so I just thought they were um, really doing great work, really, really diverse work. All right, thank you. Other comments, please. I think they just so thoroughly understand the audience and the audience needs. And I think that's really apparent. Um, and then to, to underscore what Lindsay was saying about really having to think more carefully and broadly about what it means to go virtual um, and to connect with their audience. That's something that I, I hadn't thought about. Um, and I just, this is kind of a, again, it's more of a, of a emotional take on the application and just the quotes that they selected from their artists, they just tugged. I mean, they were they were excellent choices. And so, you know, if you're going to put something about how you how your artists support your work and how your what impact you have, do what they did and find those kind of quotes. <laughs> it, it, it's nicely done. Thank you. All right. Other comments? I mean, just again, reiterating, um, I just really appreciate how uh, thoughtful they are on like the whole transition to being virtual, thinking of like visual impairments and those who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, and yeah, again, with hearing the art artist feedback, I feel like it's always um, participant feedback that is in these applications. So, um, here an artist specifically like Christy Grace that they mentioned. Um, really powerful. Thank you. Shan, anything to add or are we uh, good to go? Um, I, I don't think I had anything to add uh, okay. to that. Thank you. All right, sure. It sounds like we are ready to score then. Please do so.
I hear the Emery board. It's so interesting, isn't it? I sometimes it's kind of it sounds it sounds like a you know, like the old dialing too. Like now now when you hear it, like you know yes. what I mean. Like, yes. <laughs> how, how do you even remember the old dialing sound, Lindsay? He's been around theater. <laughs> I've been in plays. Yeah. <laughs> Historical plays. <laughs> Thanks. Now I really feel good. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a connection, just just some weird sort of all along the lines connection. Dale, did I did I hear you say they're in or no? No, we're still waiting for one score. Okay. Is it mine? Did I name the culprit? If it's me, you can name the culprit. No, it's no. not you. Okay. Is it me? It's Jan, yeah. It's me. Did I forget to hit send? Um, I'm already my guess. Yeah. Next thing. Okay, sorry about that. I just figured everybody needed just a moment to breathe. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry to give you a force a break. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long ways yet to the break. This is what happens. This is what happens when we enable our, uh, our panel. <laughs> All right, but do please. Um, I'll take this opportunity to just say, if you all need a break before the break is called on the agenda, please say something. We will absolutely make it happen for you. I don't I want you to be able to focus. And if you need a break, <laughs> by all means, call it out. Care. Gail. Um, you in some trouble? Yeah, I, I mean, I scored it, I hit, all the buttons and it came in on my screen as final score so i had to pull it up out of that menu and now i don't know what to hit to get it to you dale if you can just see it as it is i think you can just accept it since janice just said she's done with the numbers yeah um i'm, I'm looking at your score sheet jan i don't see any numbers in the boxes at all okay yeah. Arts for all Wisconsin, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I pulled up the wrong one. That's the mistake. Sorry for I'm the delay on self-imposed break. break. All right. Yes, for those of you who are who can uh, afford the moment, please stand up and stretch if that's what you want to do. <laughs> I'm gonna. There you go. I'm sorry, Jan. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. I got it now. All are in. Great. Okay. Right. Alone. Take a couple more seconds and stretch, just as we can. Yes. Shoulders back. I am I am fulfilling my promise not to lead yoga though. So moving <laughs> on. <laughs> um, we are now heading to Milwaukee and Black Arts Milwaukee. And Adalia, it is you. Thank you. Um, their mission statement is to increase the availability and quality of African American arts and culture. Um, their goals include um, preserving African American culture by creating opportunities for artistic development and growth. Um, they want to foster at youth risk development through cultural, culturally relevant arts and education integration and strengthen community through quality arts and youth development partnerships. Uh, their budget is around uh, $475,000. Um, and they actively engage 2,365 adults and 700 children. Um, and then, let me just scroll my notes. So Black Rock Milwaukee um, is a member group of the United Performing Arts Fund. Um, it's an in-residence group at the Marcus Performing Arts Center. Um, they have a resident theater group focused on healing and positive social change. Um, 
really focusing on individuals below the poverty line, youth at risk. Um, they want to reshape cultural stereotypes. Um, they posted a youth arts program, youth arts camp program. Um, many events were unfortunately canceled this summer, um, but they did hold some virtual arts education residencies um, in public schools and uh, invested in the dance, music, choir, and theater curriculums. Uh, one of their programs they normally do is Black Nativity by Langston Hughes. Um, and I really thought they had a great video in the work sample section um, of their summer camp. Um, they really mentioned how they bring truth and healing to the community fighting systemic racism. Um, I also thought that they could expand more with that YouTube channel um, with other various types of videos to showcase what they're doing. Um, they also mentioned that they wanted to add community members to the program committee, but it seemed a little unclear of how they would do this and what specific impact they wish to achieve. Um, I think they want to do it in their artistic programming process, but I think just further detail about that in their narrative um, would have helped. They had mentioned that in November 2019, they had hired a development consultant, um, really focusing on expanding their individual donor base as well as corporate donors. Um, their board and staff is, um, looks excellent, has state, county, and city representatives. Um, looks like over the years, they hadn't reached some of their fundraising goals prior to hiring the consultant, but they had absorbed it with operational reserves. Um, they embark in surveying their audiences, and they showed an example of their hip hop DNA program and how it received a max of 10 score from more than 30% of their diverse audience. Um, they really want to focus on being more multi-generational um, and attracting the work of young emerging artists. Um, it was great to see that they had um, a SWOT analysis um, and evaluations on like, and the various scopes. So as a whole, more of an umbrella, but also specifically on their smaller programs. Um, and I liked how they listed um, how they measure their results with youth outcomes for their youth arts camp. Um, they had said they want to provide opportunity for at-risk youth to explore their lives and talents, gain confidence specifically, um, learn basic mechanics of artistic genre and workshop residency, um, and kind of those specific career avenues, potentially with like sets, props, lighting, sound, or being on the stage. Um, and of course, the opportunity to just learn more from each other, kind of that sharing resources specifically with local professional artists in the area. That's it. All right, that's great. Thank you. Um, can I turn to you, Carrie? Yes, I will do a follow up um, again. Like Adelia, I really did uh, appreciate the video like that was provided. I do think, um, and the photographs too, which also were from, um, the photographs are primarily of Black activity. So having more variety in the work samples, but again, show the whole scope of the programming. Um, I had some just clarification questions or just maybe better understanding uh, overall of how concepts are um, taken and made how they're accepted. What is the process? I mean, it's explained, but I guess I just didn't understand completely um, of how many ideas are presented or how they get ideas, uh, how the vetting process. Maybe that's just more detail that I personally need than an application really needs. That's just more of a comment than anything else. And I would say that they do need to update their short and long range planning documents um, for them to be really useful for the organization. But they've done some really good work and um, I found that they're, they were having success um, prior to the pandemic and they've managed to do some pivoting like, like lots of other places. And it would have been a little bit, it would have been better, it would have been good to have seen or read more of the partnerships that they have developed 
particularly more recently, so to show how they are managing. Gary, I'll just be consistent and ask, do you remember what the date is on their uh, the plan that they submitted? I don't remember. Okay, I'll look it up. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you. All right, other comments? Karen, is it okay for me to provide some context to the to this uh, application? We ask you to be on this panel because you bring more than just your geography. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I had a chance to review, uh, I think it was the first application that this organization uh, submitted uh, to this program uh, a few years ago. And, uh, and one of the things that has happened between now and then is that it's, its function, not its purpose, but its function appears to have changed. Uh, when it was originally conceived in 2014, it was in the aftermath of the decimation of uh, culturally specific African-American arts organizations in Milwaukee, or at least their, or at least their finances. Because before the before the recession, they had been uh, financed. I, I I'm not going to say that they were exclusively financed, but they had been largely financed by donations from corporations and government agencies and not for profit agencies that were trying to improve the community. Uh, after, when the recession hit, a number of those funds either disappeared or got reallocated to, to bit more basic human services uh, activities. And so a lot of the, the culturally specific black organizations in Milwaukee found themselves either out of business or on the edge of disaster, uh, literally on the edge of disaster. The idea for Black Arts Milwaukee was that what, what, what one of the potential solutions was to create a back room for, uh, for management expertise, management and fundraising expertise for all of these organizations. Now, Bronzeville was one of, was one of the organizations that was uh, potentially part of it. There had been several others that were at least thought to be potential, um, uh, potential participants with uh, Black Lives Milwaukee. And uh, what I see now is that is that Bronzeville has become their primary client. Um, and knowing that they want to enhance the uh, enhance the the uh, preserve and enhance uh, African American culture and the other two things they said <laughs> at the beginning of this, they have obviously started to fill niches in programming either by by working with other producers or by bringing in touring attractions. And it, I think it would have been very helpful if they had said that up front. On the other hand, it could be that six years into the process, they don't remember where they started and they don't expect anybody else to either. So, uh, but, but that context would have been helpful to me as I, as I read the application. Thanks, Jim. That was entirely appropriate. Um, and, and I just double checked and it looks like that. So it looks like, OK, so anyway, I've answered my question about the strategic plan. Um, moving on, other uh, other comments. Um, I didn't have any anything else to add. I appreciate the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. I have nothing else. Uh, I love seeing these niche organizations like this and the Latino arts and um, some of the other smaller organizations that just add a richness of the, the cultural um, background and, and fabric of the community. All right, if there are no other comments, please score.
All right, all the scores are in. OK, um, do not get whiplash. We're going to take a deep breath and we are moving from rural, from urban to rural here. We are heading up to Shell Lake and the Shell Lake Art Center. So uh, reground yourself in the rural for a moment. And Lindsay, it is your lead. Thank you. Enjoy the scenic drive. Beautiful <laughs> scenery. Um, Shell Lake, the mission of the Shell Lake Art Center is to provide creative arts education and enrichment experiences for diverse populations of youth and adult learners. So they accomplish this by hosting 20 summer camps, which include 40 concerts in a variety of genres. They also have plays, a film series, and a performance series. Um, with COVID, they still hosted some of their camps. They listed that they had seven virtual camps. Um, they have expanded and recently merged with the Erica Kwam Memorial Theater. Uh, and not, this is not necessarily a weakness, but I did, I would like to know more about that merge and how it came about and did they absorb things that the, that theater was doing? Um, are they replacing that work or are they adding to it? And I, so I had a question about that, but I, it sounds like it was a good thing for the community to make that merge. Um, they typically employ 100 teachers and camp staff, and many of those teachers are returning and they have been for decades, which is a testament to the work that they're doing there. Good board involvement and expertise, um, obviously an asset for them is their location, although I have not been there. What they wrote about is beautiful and what I've seen looks great. I want to go right now. <laughs> um, try to keep registration low and offer scholarships. Um, they have added new programs like an orchestra workshop and a first year band student master class. Many of their students go on to have careers in the arts. So talk about impact. That's a good one. Um, provide opportunities in culturally underser underserved area. They do invite their local leaders um, to attend their events and their Senator Janet Bewley attended um, and a, a welcomed guests to one of them and was going to again this year. So that's a good, um, good partnership and connection. Um, they said, we, we talk about the, the hardships of COVID, but they mentioned that with their virtual programming, they are reaching students from all over the world. So that is a great silver lining. Um, 50 of their 50% 50 of their participants are returning students. So again, um, attests to the quality of the work that they're doing there. Um, they are currently evaluating, I think that, I'm gonna, what, did my, what does my note mean? Evaluating new staff members and structuring. So they must be going through some, some uh, planning and restructuring. Uh, they have educator surveys and they gave an example of um, how their first year band student program was added, came directly out of those surveys and listening to the instructors feedback on what would be helpful. So I thought that was great. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about how their surpluses are used each year. Um, great that they're surpluses versus deficits, but, you know, do they have a plan for that? What do they do with that funding? Um, oh, this probably is what my note was. Um, they have an interim director right now. Um, their former director left in March. Um, and so that, that's not listed, I guess, as a weakness, but just something to note that they are going through some growing pains or restructuring and working through it. Thank you, Lindsay. All righty, turning to the second reader, Carrie. I found their program um, evaluation tools to be wonderful. Uh, their evaluation form and their program application form, so that form used to propose new um, classes. Both are, are really good forms. Um, uh, the fact that 40, 40 area schools send students to Shell Lake is kind of testimony to the, the wide support they have throughout Western and Northern Wisconsin. I think that's important. The theater offerings do not appear, appear to be as fully developed as the music offerings, but that's probably also, it's a recent merger as well, so that's probably something in development. Um, again, underscoring what Lindsay said about how the virtual out offerings have really made it possible to to reach further um, and the limitations of geography are not there in some ways the financial limitations aren't necessarily there either performing music online 
um, is a different experience altogether in the fact that they were able to uh, really make about about 30 percent, a third of their summer camps possible this summer, you know, with only a few months notice um, that is to be commended. Thank you. Um, before I ask for other comments, just to clarify for uh, but Lindsay, you asked what the story about the merger was, and the Qualm uh, board was feeling like they were done, and uh, they had been in discussion for a while, and uh, and Shell Lake, and uh, and they had a conversation, and um, uh, or a series of them, and so Shell Lake uh, ended up taking over that Qualm Theater facility and the Theater in the Woods um, uh, legacy in a way. And uh, so that's the piece that I know about that. It was definitely not a, you know, a, a, a takeover. <laughs> there was very definitely a, a cooperative activity. <laughs> All right, other comments on this? I thought it was interesting how they noted that the community is invited to participate ad hoc in board committees. I thought that was important to um, take into account that input. Um, and really thought it was a great asset that they have uh, such strong relationships with um, faculty from UW River Falls, UW Eau Claire, and Indiana University. Other comments? We've been talking about out of both sides of our mouths on this uh, all, all day. Um, uh, since this is a retrospective grant, it would have been helpful if they'd recap the past three years. Um, and of course, when organizations have uh, have recapped the last three years, we've said, but what about COVID? What are you doing about that? So we're, we're talking out of both sides of our mouths about that. But I did miss a, uh, a comment about what had been happening. On the other hand, the merger with the, with the Quam Theater is an important thing. And uh, if, as, if I think back to 2008, Theater in the Woods was one of the two or three finest small organizations uh, that I reviewed that year. And, um, and, and I hope that, uh, that Shell Lake uh, Arts Center will, will continue its legacy because it, it did really extraordinary things uh, in, in a sparsely populated portion of the world. Um, and I, I'm excited about the prospects for that. I look forward to seeing to learning more about that. I was just going to add to comment that um, the, the self evaluation forms were good and uh, I thought helpful um, and um, uh, would have liked to have seen them used to how they're used to define programming a little bit, but I, I didn't um, uh, find the organizational plan um, uh, available with this, this group. As in you didn't find an organizational plan at I, all? I didn't find a, a strategic plan. So um, so I was just following up on Jim's uh, request for some. So you wanted more information than just the one paragraph about yeah. what they've been up to over the last three years. Yeah, got it. That and, and I'm looking in the support material just to see what I can find. Um, and there's a Shell Lake organizational plan that is an org chart. It's a chart. It's, a chart. Yeah. it's not a plan. Got it. OK. Thank you. If there are no other comments, please go ahead and score. All the scores are in. OK, well then, we are heading uh, east again to Sheboygan and Bookworm Gardens. Adalia, please. All right, so we're in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Um, their mission is to enrich the mind, body, and spirit 
of the young and young at heart through exploration in a garden environment based on children's literature. Um, it's founded in 2009 and uh, approximately has 80,000 visitors. It says from across the, straight, across the state and the country. Um, it has an educational department um, focused on field trips, camps, um, family festivals, as well as adult workshops. Um, it has special events with performing artists at times, um, really has a strong base of volunteers. Um, and now with COVID, it's more that has dropped off and it's now just the staff, which is I'm about 15. Um, they opened one month late this summer. Um, normally their season is from May to October. So they started in June. Um, and they did quite well in adapting their outdoor space. So um, they changed it to unidirectional traffic and they added a lot of sanitizing stations. Um, and they also advantageously unveiled um, three new garden spaces. Um, they have really strong donor relations, um, very much on a grassroots um, kind of vibe, um, lots of individual funds. Um, they have a lot of uh, local community partners. Um, they collaborate with local chefs for a dinner series. Um, they work with the Beekeeper Association and Mental Health of America, um, as well as other local multidisciplinary artists. Um, they utilize surveys from teachers and parents. Um, and they also, being an outdoor space, they really provide um, opportunity for folks to explore the environment and kind of reflect, reflect on the space they occupy. Um, their educational programming relates to horticulture, art, music, um, environmental science, and literature. Um, they said that this year they had a lot of more first-time visitors, um, mainly because with the pandemic, a lot of people are wanting more outdoor activities. Um, and they also mentioned how they wanted to avoid kind of this um, perception of being elitist. Um, and they combated that with um, field trips that I mentioned earlier. Um, I wasn't able to open the Vimeo link that they had provided on the work sample, um, but that might have just been my computer. Um, let's see, they utilize a consultant um, for their strategic plan in 2019. Um, they, one, one comment that I feel like they could change for future applications, they provided a document that said they didn't have um, a marketing plan, and I feel like instead of posting that they could have just added um, another document instead in a different category. Um, I was also curious since now they're closed from November to April um, how they're reflecting for next year and if they're going to be providing any virtual programs or how they're going to sustain their community engagement during these months. So um, they're a mid-sized organization, and so they are required to have a marketing plan, which mm -hmm. is probably why they decided to to put that in there, just to say, don't look for one, we don't have one. Okay. So just at a guess. Um, Jan, you are second on this one. Yeah. Um, so I, I hadn't heard of this organization, so it was curious to me. Um, so I, I spent, a, I think I spent a great deal of time trying to understand what it really was <laughs> and how it functioned. Um, so I felt um, the narrative didn't really help me get through how it was organized um, as well. And But they're uh, interesting, interesting mix of um, calendar of events uh, um, and um, offerings uh, in a short period of time. I did review their website um, and still I, I um, would have liked to have seen something. I too couldn't open the Vimeo link, so I don't know what that was um, uh, meant to reveal, but um, missed some of that except for the um, uh, stationary uh, images. Um, they seem um, an organization that uh, um, has uh, been examining itself over time, possibly wasn't ready for uh, the influx of, of people uh, due to COVID, um, but um, seemed to be able to respond quickly enough to extend their exhibits and, and um, uh, work with 75 
exhibitions, which I think was 10 more than they had initially anticipated. Um, but I too then wonder how they deal with their audiences um, as the season declines. I, I didn't find that information, in, you know, as they, they go off season. Um, so I didn't see that. Um, I, and I thought their seasonal uh, offerings were, were impressive. They were very creative um, in terms of their interpretations and, and um, um, the way they had developed a variety of sensory levels of, of material. Um, and so I just um, looked at uh, the organization a, a little bit from a, a, a scale of, of um, maybe seeing some rapid growth and, and um, in this pandemic and just wondering what kind of strategic viewpoint they're, they're taking. Uh, I did see a strategic plan, but I didn't see sort of outcomes with that. And, I, and it looks like the growth could down the road pose challenges for, for um, the impact on volunteers as well as the, the scale of their staff um, and um, maybe exceed their ability to serve at some point in time. Whoops, I was muted. Other comments, please. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I have no other comments. I love the uniqueness of this organization. Uh, once again, this is one that I got to see in its first application of the program. And um, uh, it's 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 such a unique idea. And uh, and I, I love the crossing of the art, the arts and the sciences. Uh, I, I think that we should uh, we should acknowledge that more than we do, and I think this does a, a very nice job. Do you feel? Oh, Carrie, did you have something to add? No, I don't have anything to add. Alrighty. Um, did you feel that you had enough information uh, about the artistic quality of the work? Uh, and so I, I, if you don't want to call that out, go ahead and put that in the comment sheet for sure. Um, I did look at their, the, um, the Vimeo thing. It doesn't work for me either. Um, but the, the title Happily Haunted and Bookworm Gardens brings up something, you know, if you dig deep uh, on, the, um, on the web. So there is that. Okay. Um, if there are no other comments, please go ahead and, and score. All right, it appears all the scores are here. Okay, then that is it for the mid-sized uh, budget organizations and multidisciplinary. We're moving now to the large. And the first one uh, here is Kids from Wisconsin. And Jim, it is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when, when you ask an old, people to an old person to introduce things, you get a history lesson. Sorry. <laughs> um, the uh, Kids from Wisconsin uh, was incorporated independently in 1982, but from 1969 until that time, it was part of the St Wisconsin State Fair. Uh, under the, underneath the Wisconsin State Fair Board. Uh, it had been brought into being by Governor Knowles in 1969 as part of a movement around the country toward highlighting clean-cut young people because that was the height of the hippie era. <laughs> I'm just telling you, this is true. <laughs> and it has continued in that vein ever since. Now, it does fulfill its mission. Uh, Kids from Wisconsin is designed to uh, to work with young people ages 15 to 20 with demonstrated talent in musical performance. 
They are professionally trained to provide positive family-oriented performances, and they do so for over 120,000 people annually. Uh, about half those people are when they are uh, performing at the state fairgrounds, which they still do, uh, and other, uh, and the rest is on a tour that they take through Wisconsin to a variety of communities with local sponsors, either not-for-profit organizations or um, uh, or venues or uh, or service clubs like Rotary or or Kiwanis. Uh, the Kids from Wisconsin Experience enhances the students' uh, professional performing skills. It develops leadership potential by, by uh, training them to, uh, to deliver workshops to high school students and younger at each of the stops they make on their tour. And then it also partners with many community service groups to deliver affordable, high-quality performances. It's been going for either 51 or 52 years. They used both, both figures in the application. Um, and uh, they annually perform to 120,000 adults and 30,000 children in 39 communities, including Milwaukee or West Dallas. Um, let's see. They have been working very strongly over the past several years to, uh, to become a more diverse organization to become a more diverse and racially sensitive organization. Uh, they appear to be making uh, progress on that goal. Uh, let's see what else is here. They partner with the State Fair, that's where their rehearsal uh, facilities are, and with Wisconsin, I'm sorry, that's where their performance uh, possibilities are, They're where they start the tour. But uh, was, they also per, uh, partner with Wisconsin Lutheran College in the summer uh, where they get housing and rehearsal space. And they created, uh, as part of their response to, um, uh, to feedback from sponsors, uh, they created this best practices handbook to help uh, local sponsor organizations market the, uh, the program so that they don't lose money when they bring uh, kids from Wisconsin to their program uh, or to their communities. Um, they do, a, the, it's a nine week tour. Um, they have lots of feedback and surveys and uh, they do, they do Zoom meetings with the sponsors uh, before and after the event takes place and they do exit interviews with the performers. And those were the things that were included in the feedback uh, from their, as part of their strategic planning that created the best practices book. Um, I, I noticed looking at their finances that they created, a, they appear to have created a board designated endowment of approximately half a million dollars in 2018. It would have been interesting to, uh, to get some uh, insight into the, into the purpose of that, into the, into the thinking behind creating this as an endowment. Uh, and they made a great, a creative pivot into the COVID summer. And that's as far as I'll go. Okay, thank you. Adalia. Yeah, that was a wonderful summary. Um, I just feel like it's so important how they focus on providing high quality performances and the formal price um, for underserved communities across the state. Um, the Realize Your Dream um, initiative, which is an outreach to the Boys and Girls Club. Um, also focus on sensory friendly performances um, and they have that arts spotlight um, part where like business partners can showcase um, their products kind of just co-promote each other and boost the economy. Um, really wonderful how students have that leadership opportunity and um, receive professional training for um, careers in music and the arts. Um, I liked how they could learn about audition process um, and learning, you know, specific dances and question and answer, question and answer sessions afterward. Um, and yeah, that's it. Great, thank you. Comments from others, please. I, I, I guess I kept looking at this organization. 
um, certainly with the, the performance emphasis, um, but wondering what, what more could be done to engage the community when um, they're traveling around and, and role model and example. I, I read into the um, Realize Your Dream workshops or the, the workshops that were being offered and there wasn't real strong direction as to how people were selected to participate and what numbers there were, um, but they were only an hour long. And um, when the organization is, is going into the community and, and trying to make that kind of an impact, I really felt there could be something um, much more inclusive and extensive perhaps um, in, in um, reaching out to um, those local audiences besides the performance. So um, that's where my mind was kind of going with this. And, um, it, it, um, and as, as wonderful as the performances are uh, and how much training these this select group of, of uh, youth get to, to perform, um, I would like to see more in terms of outreach in their planning and maybe move forward. Um, and Jan, if you have any thoughts, just in terms of constructive suggestions or whatever, please feel free to put those in the comments. If you, uh, yeah, I'll move into um, uh, Lindsay or Carrie, any comments on this? Um, I, I wouldn't just on that topic, um, and I certainly, cannot speak on behalf of the organization, but I am familiar enough with it. Uh, full disclosure, I auditioned for it when I was 16 and I did not get in, but I will not hold it against them while I'm grading today. <laughs> but um, I wonder if some of the outreach is motivated by the organizations that book them in their theaters in the, in the community that they're going to versus how much is motivated by kids from Wisconsin themselves, if that kind of makes sense. Like they're offering these but the presenting organization um, can just book the show, just the show, or can look for other outreach opportunities. And so I wonder what that collaboration is, um, who, who, which of the two parties is more active in trying to make those happen? Does that make sense? Yes. Is anybody there? Um, can you see us or are you, are you still just looking at your screen? Oh, that's probably, yeah, you're probably nodding. No, um, because I switched to the desktop version when my computer went kaput, I cannot see anybody. So um, I just hear you. Uh. <laughs> you're, you're, you're hearing some nodding going on around oh. the room. Okay, oh. good. Um, then the only, and I thought that um, everything else that was said were, were in my notes. So um, really, yeah, the Boys and Girls Club, the, like the outreach that they are doing and the, the sensory friendly options, I think are wonderful. Um, then this is just a little note and going to what the NEA is asking of. I'm pretty sure this was the only organization that listed, and this is a sensitive thing maybe to talk about, but that listed that white people didn't make up 25% or more of um the audience and so i just wondered if that was intentional or not because in the state of wisconsin our most of our diversity is well we're just not very diverse um so just a note as you know maybe that is accurate it just was the only one that listed that that but was perhaps perhaps um it's a note to staff to double check that with the applicant before we send those results to the nea in perhaps. our report yeah thank you it could be true this was a surprise to me right I think your instincts are right. Okay. All righty. Other comments on this one? Carrie, you are muted. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> That's right. I sneezed. So I, yeah, I can't sneeze in public anymore. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, just one little tiny comment is as far as impact goes, I think maybe this is so obvious that it didn't need to be stated but the impact is also on the, the artists themselves the, the the participants and what a deep experience that is and i think having the watch parties with the alumni um is evidence that that is an experience that is uh, you know life-changing for a lot of them so i think that's also really kind of it it means something to those who are participating and they're and they're willing to do it even during COVID season as challenges that must have been or is. 
Thank you. All righty. Any other comments before we score this? All right, please score. Dale, was that your soft voice saying you have them in? Not yet. Okay, I was hearing something, some kind of feedback. No, they're in, thank you. Okay, awesome. All righty, we are now heading to Fond du Lac and the Thelma Sadoff Center for the Arts. And Lindsay, you are starting us off. All right, the Thelma, Thelma Sadoff Center for the Arts. That's a kind of a mouthful. Um, I like it. <laughs> um, their mission is enriching our community through the arts. They have over 400 arts events per year from concerts, films, theater, children's programming, um, camps, summer series, street parties, reading series, book clubs, and exhibits. So very multidisciplinary. Um, during COVID, they still have some virtual concerts, outdoor concerts, uh, a mixture of virtual and in-person classes, art exhibits, virtual art talks, book clubs continued virtually. Um, there was a virtual poetry contest and an outdoor art contest. So uh, certainly still a lot going on there. I made a note that I really liked their promo video. So one of their support materials must have just been a, like a, a, in general promo video for what the organization does. And it was very helpful to get a kind of the overall picture. I wish every arts organization could do this and had a budget to do it because it, it really was great. So um, there's a good uh, best practice maybe. Is, I think a lot of it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, they had goals to have their operations um, covered by 50% of earned revenue and they already passed that goal. Their final mortgage was paid on the building in 2019. Um, engagement coordinator successfully increasing corporate engagement. Uh, they also have the luxury of having the, the Sadoff Family Foundation grant, which has been um, wonderful for their organization sustainability. Partnerships with the Fond du Lac Community Theater, Boys and Girls Club, Big Brothers and Big Sisters. Those are great. Um, the budget, I thought the budget was explained well and they are ahead of some of their goals. They did receive a three-year operations grant, which has helped them to expand their programming, um, generate new re revenue, um, elevate offerings. And um, I, I didn't write this down, but I'm remembering maybe a boost in salaries. Um, but that one, I'm just remembering. I didn't write it. Um, in 2020, they did the Year of the Woman and other exhibits supporting minorities. They are involved with the City Arts Board, and they are often called upon to support others in the community. So that's a, that's great to be that resource. Um, the executive director is on the Fond du Lac Reopening Task Force, and so very involved in the community and with local leaders. They seem to be very key for the economic activity in the area. The uh, highlight I wanted to put in there was the Humanity Project of Fond du Lac. Um, so a, a study on how race, racism has impacted the community. They offer free events and they specifically wrote that no child is turned away from participation. Um, so that is impressive. They've created careful phased plans for reopening surveys to gauge community on feelings on their on activities dur um, during the pandemic, um, what their comfort levels were. And so they really took that feedback to determine what they were going to offer and how they would offer it. They reviewed their strategic plan annually. They have surveys and, um, and good social media feedback, focus groups. The focus group, in fact, helped them redesign their membership program. And I thought that they had a, a good marketing plan included. The only um, weakness or comment that I had was uh, that they have challenges of retaining part-time staff and finding new donors, but they said that they have strategies to try to achieve these goals. Thank you. All right, Jan, please. Good. Um, yeah, thank you, Les. Lindsay. I, I probably don't have a lot to add that I wouldn't duplicate what you had to say. Um, that uh, I think uh, they're recent expansion of their exhibition program is a is a strength focusing on um, 
not only just um, uh, engaging a, a regional arts community, but doing that with a deliberate sense of community responsibility and, and reaching out to the underserved populations, particularly with the youth agencies and the, the women's uh, exhibition focus that they took. Um, I thought that was that was good. Um, they um, have kind of an ambitious annual schedule and um, uh, their organizational structure seems to um, be able to uh, generate revenue through that um, and diversify the re revenue streams that uh, has been successful for them. Um, and um, build some some um, regular patronage over time. Um, the um, Music has been a strong focus in, in the performing arts aspect, although um, the uh, changes in their exhibition focus uh, seem to be engaging the community in a different level, so that was good. Um, I thought the strategic plan mostly provided direction on, on their performance, but um, uh, there are definitely efforts that uh, look like they've included to reach out to new audiences and uh, cultivate other revenue streams. Um, so. That's that's all that I have to say. Okay, thank you. Other comments? I don't have any of note. Okay, thank you. This was the organization that made me that made me finally realize that uh, part of the reason for discrepancies in the budget is is uh, that they don't consider that they don't consider covering they don't consider falling short of covering depreciation on their fixed mm -hmm. assets as being a deficit. Um, it, it was in looking at their at their uh, commentary on um, uh, on their on their budget that uh, made me finally realize that 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 was one of the issues. That's great. Well, that will help us with consistency going forward at the end uh, when we talk about this. Thank you. Great. And Jim, did you have a qualitative uh, comment to make in addition to that observation or simply it's an observation moving on? That is an observation. That okay. That is simply an observation. I uh, I don't fault anybody for it. It's a, it's a perception of the way in which we, we define deficit. And I'll talk about I'll talk about the problem with the prompt uh, in uh, when when we get to the end of the discussion. Thank you. Lovely. There is a problem with the prompt. Yep. But we're going to fix it because that's what we do. <laughs> Adalia, were you going to try to say something earlier? No, I was just saying that the comments covered all of my notes. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all. Please go ahead and score then. What rank did I leave? That one. Okay, all the scores are here. Okay. Now we are heading south to Genesee Depot and Jan, if you could lead us through the 10 Chimneys Foundation application, that would be great. Okay. Um, this is an organization that uh, has been around for 18 years. It opened in uh, to the public in 2003 um, as a, um, with an effort to um, preserve the mission to um, preserve the legacy of um, Alfred Lunt and, and Lynn Fontaine. Um, it was an incredible estate that uh, uh, is now being shared with the public as a, a national treasure um, with the, the focus on um, an inspiration for theater uh, arts and, and um, the art of living. Uh, very, very interesting, um, that in itself. Um, they do offer some public programs. Um, uh, and uh, things that are consistent with telling the story of the lifestyle of, of um, um, Lunt and Fontaine. Um, 
it um, is an interesting organization um, that has this kind of um, national reach uh, with a variety of um, uh, theater prof uh, theater and music professionals on their board uh, from a national scale uh, who come together. Um, so broad broad access to uh, actor, actors for master classes and um, uh, obviously uh, to develop uh, theater skills in, in the participants. Um, uh, there's incredible potential to engage audiences uh, with this opportunity. Um, and um, as I looked at some of the programs, I would have loved to have learned more from audience response. What, what, what's the audience gaining from this? Um, the, there are expansive grounds where um, the, the whole rich experience of what it was like to be in the theater lifestyle and of uh, the Fontaines and, um, and uh, the Lunts, the, we'll just use the Lunts, um, that uh, provide visitors um, an overview of, of um, what it was like to come to the, the this Wisconsin retreat um, and then be engaged in sort of this, uh, commun this theatrical community dialogue, these conversations, so they could continue some of these programs um, that probably took place with um, people who came to visit the, the, the uh, notaries uh, in the theatrical world that came and, and uh, had this uh, luxuriating experience on, on this expansive estate at some point in time. So living true to this form, they, they have uh, tried to remake these, this in terms of some public programming um, with theatrical conversations, uh, cabaret style performances, um, music in the drawing room um, to kind of in light, to bring about the what that environment was like at one point in time. It's targeting primarily adult participants, it seems, um, for engagement. And, and it's such a unique and, and specialized environment. Um, uh, I really wondered how it needed to reinvent itself during this, this COVID crisis. Um, so one thing I did find interesting was they uh, created a, um, a symposium um, that sounds like a, a, a really um, interesting new direction, a theater symposium that um, uh, was apparently a success and, and something that uh, could be repeated, and, uh, I believe two days long. And um, this gave, as a, a virtual opportunity, gave them uh, access to uh, extend to uh, organizations across the United States. So it was no longer just place bound um, and could possibly be strengthening financially as something as a continued um, prospect for them, um, which I thought could um, um, you know, find some, some place in additional outreach programming. Um, they have tried to diversify their program, I think, a little bit and broaden their, their appeal to a greater public. Um, but I, I would still like to see more in terms of um, what kind of engagement could happen. Um, they, have quite, they have quite a bit going on for a seasonal operation. And I uh, would love to know more of what they actually do in the off season uh, on their premises. Um, and, um, uh, how else they engage audiences. So um, some of their programming seemed more internally, internally focused, particularly since it's kind of a training ground and how that um, comes, comes forward as a public resource would be um, something I think uh, nice to um, envelop in any virtual sense moving forward as they get a feel for putting together the uh, symposiums and, um, oh. and any exercises from this pandemic that they're learning from the virtual uh, reality. Uh, just to inform audiences more about the, the behind the scenes sort of thing behind uh, about theater and, and keep people engaged. Um, so I would look 
to them for maybe some additional outreach um, and more community engagement at some level that would in, in, um, involve audiences uh, a little bit further. I, oh, I think of note, um, the um, infrastructure um, uh, opportunity, uh, they've, they've gone through and, and completed a $12 million restoration program, um, huge grounds, uh, a number of buildings to take care of, uh, um, including the uh, internal um, uh, collections uh, and, and decor. Um, but at some point down the road, um, I think that probably needs to be planned for and addressed to revisit uh, as uh, maybe noting some of Jim, Jim's concern on buildings and infrastructure. Um, that's that's um, an incredible um, uh, undertaking. And uh, the seasons in Wisconsin are not friendly to these kinds of environments. Um, so um, future planning, I would have liked to have seen you know, the, the stability of future planning for this. Thank you. Gary, let's turn to you. I found this site, which I've seen on billboards for years, but I've never been to, um, interesting in how it's, that the, it's humanities and arts funded into it. I mean, it's as much a historic site as it is an, an arts organization. I think the narrative sometimes blurred that so it seems sometimes the focus is more on his historic humanities um, contributions and more or less so than on, it, on its arts. So that's something to in the future to focus more more clearly on how it serves the arts. Um, and then also noticing that there are very there are two very different audiences that it, that it serves. Um, artists who come and participate in the master artist program and those who want to see the historic site and so trying to how, how does the organization balance that um, that isn't that could be clear in in the narrative um so those are my two big comments when it came to this organization Thank um, you. i i really i the summit on racism in theater timely and um, if you can do nothing else, you can have the summit online. Um, that was a, a good thing to do during the pandemic. It does show, the application does show that it has a broad base of support in terms of donors and volunteers, although there are challenges with volunteers. And again, the volunteers are more volunteers working on the historic site aspect of it. Um, and that's all. All right, thank you. We have less than one minute left, but I think it deserves more discussion. Jim, Lindsay, Adalia. Okay, I've got something. Um, the, as, as Carrie just said, the impetus for the creation of this organization was to save the historic facilities and property. And they figured out the programming later. In essence, the unspoken mission of the organization is make this a good idea, as my friend Andrew Taylor used to say. Uh, the, uh, every, every organization has an unspoken mission, especially if there is a facility associated with it. And it's usually make this a good idea. Um, I think they've done a brilliant job at trying to become a resource for the uh, for the nationwide uh, live repertory theater community. One of the things that they neglected to say when they talked about the master artist program uh, is that the master artist is there to train fellows and the fellows are the the actors who are who are nominated by uh, the artistic directors of the leading uh, uh, resident theater companies in the United States with the idea that those people will go and learn under a mensch, 
and um, and then will bring that training back to their companies and raise the level of of theater of acting of performance uh, in the repertory theater world. Um, that, that wasn't they they left a paragraph out of the discussion of that of that program. So that plus the the retreat program that they talk about plus the racism in theater uh, uh, discussion that they hosted this summer are all ways of being in service to uh, the, the nationwide theater community, and uh, that's the niche they've carved for themselves for their programmatic activity in addition to maintaining and operating the historic site. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just a few other things to add. Um, definitely top notch artists, and it, it sounds incredible the work that they're doing there. Um, their docent training is a 14 week program, which is crazy. That's very thorough training. It takes you a lot longer to learn your way around the farm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I thought it was interesting that they mentioned in the budget information that they have had surpluses because they were planned for surpluses in anticipation of an economic downturn. Well, good job, <laughs> but they're wanting it now. Um, I did wonder, um, but this is like maybe a general statement about the arts, like when you're when you're such a specific and focused organization like what they're doing um th they listed that they have zero youth engagement right so i'm like torn with that because i think i think we get this mentality that arts organizations have to be everything and do everything for everybody all the time and all age groups and like <laughs> just do it all um and so i noticed that they said they have zero youth engagement and immediately i was like well why like why what could what else could they be doing? But then I stepped back and if they're doing what their mission is and what they want to do very well, that's what is important. But I did wonder if they probably are doing stuff for youth and they just didn't list that because it wasn't a major part of what they do. Like two high schools maybe come there and tour. Uh, so I wondered about that. Um, maybe they maybe they really don't, but um, I wondered. And then they, I have a note that they included, instead of including a strategic plan, they, and I'm sorry if somebody else did mention this, but yeah. instead of including a strategic plan, they said they, they, they included their agenda for a future planning session. Yeah, right. That was it. Thank you. Adalia, any thoughts? Yeah, definitely echoing what everyone was saying. I think my just biggest note was I loved the resources they provided um, to the actors and theaters, but um, it was kind of like, yeah, the physical location just being so isolated and, and also being seasonal. Um, I'm just wondering like what other opportunity there is to expand their programming and continue their relations with um, the various individual donor base that they want to um, maintain. So, yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? Otherwise, as John said, we have spent a, a goodly amount of time on this one. And if you're ready to score, please do that. Okay, all the scores are in. Awesome. All right, this takes us to uh, the last of the multidisciplinary arts organizations today. In the large budget category uh, in Sheboygan, we have the John Michael Kohler Art Center. And Jan, you lead us in this one again. Um, large budget category on uh, John Michael Kohler, who we are. Um, John Michael Kohler uh, is an organization that was founded in 1967 um, to offer arts for all uh, and maintain free admission, uh, a noble goal in this, this period. Uh, its mission statement is uh, to generate and create, uh, uh, and create an exchange between artists and the public 
So they envision the world in which communities collaborate and explore the arts to nourish and uh, enrich the lives of all. So um, with that, generally working with living artists and um, uh, presenting those programs. Let me into my specific notes. Um, uh, the John Michael Kohler integrates a contemporary art experience with the community in a manner that introduces the unusual that is both enlightening and inviting uh, curiosity for arts uh, aficionados without excluding the uninitiated audiences. Um, I think they, they kind of try to make it fun. Uh, their diverse programming um, offers um, evidence of a close examination of their community cultural needs and, and um, a sensitivity toward inclusion. Their educational programming begins at um, age three in partnership with the um, Sheboygan Public School System. Um, and um, tours offer uh, uh, and, uh, and hands-on learning um, are offered for a kind of a K-12 experience. Um, it wasn't stated, though, uh, how that meets um, uh, the uh, Department of Public Instruction standards. So um, I would have liked more uh, about that um, as they have talked about the tour programs. Um, the, in a virtual sense, they did um, uh, change some of their lesson plans and pivot to offering things um, uh, virtually. Uh, replacing tours um, that did uh, that probably did meet uh, w, um, Wisconsin uh, Department of uh, Education standards, um, and then additional adult learning, um, uh, in particular with uh, for those with memory loss, um, seem to be uh, important new uh, aspects for uh, lifelong learning that they've um, added in. Uh, they've consistently offered uh, programming. Um, with a broadly diversified staff to provide uh, both curatorial and educational expertise. Uh, they financially leverage their community partnerships to adequately provide um, um, for their programming um, and uh, address the cultural diversity and economic needs of the community. Um, they've um, admitted that cultivating sponsorship has been a challenge and the pandem uh, pandemic may be a challenge for that. Um, so um, they've been um, looking at new ways to to create engagement for for um, uh, to meet these financial setbacks and, and possible challenges that uh, they may be facing. Um, they stated that visitor feedback was gathered and community partners are engaged in conversations and that helps fuel efforts for the their 63 person staff. However, um, information wasn't really given on how they use the focus groups um, or um, committee planning or their input mechanisms to identify and select their programming. So I was kind of curious as to what the connections were between input they were gathering and their ultimate results and outcomes. Um, they place a great deal of community discussion, um, or at least have a lot of community uh, discussion. Seems like they they um, uh, make a point of getting out into the community. Um, so you almost have to fill in the blanks a, a little bit that those conversations continue to evolve and help feed some of the program di direction, but that's not directly uh, implemented. Um, Five minutes left. Okay. Uh, staff were noted outside the community, um, not necessarily uh, board uh, involvement in this community. The most recent strategic plan was mentioned and, as completed, um, and a mention of some key accomplishments. Um, and additionally, uh, it would have been helpful to probably identify some key learnings and initiatives moving forward from some of that. So. Um, Um, from the scale of the organization, it would have been helpful to know more about its evaluation and planning processes, um, I think, for their de decision making and uh, formal visitor feedback mechanisms in some place for their interpretive planning. Um, in, OK, I think that's it.
I'll let All somebody right. else. Okay. Thank you, Jim. They did make note that public programs are an integral part of the exhibition design and content. That is, that is, they don't they don't decide what the exhibition is going to be and how it's going to look, and then find public programs for it. They they plan they plan it with the public programs in mind, and they are part of the uh, they are every bit as a part of the uh, 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 a part as much a part of the uh, curatorial process as the uh, as the layout of the exhibition, whatever it might be. Uh, they are uh, dedicated to participatory programming and they're, I forget what they call the program, but I can find it. Um, their Connecting Communities program is based first in the community and then in the identification of the project and the artist, uh, which, is, which is an important uh, uh, thing in their favor. Um, I, I think this is uh, this is an organization that that undertakes a wide variety of activities uh, and some of them are inward looking, but many of them are very definitely outward looking in ways that uh, the few institutions uh, implement. Thank you, Jim. Other comments? I thought they had great marketing plans. I appreciated that they had um, two separate ones for their um, two different programs. Um, and I also appreciated their five-year strategic planning process, uh, specifically like the layout. I thought that it successfully listed breakdowns. Great. Lindsay or Carrie? I don't have anything to add. Um, and my only comment is pretty quick. Everything else was covered. I just, this is the first time that I've specifically wrote down that I noticed um, they have dual language surveys and evaluations. Mm -hmm. Thought that was a good practice for certain communities, especially that have a lot of diversity. Great. Um, should I write that down as the best practice for the appropriate? Yes, okay. I'm yeah. getting a yes on that one. Yeah. Um, and what about? Um, the marketing plan that you called out, Adalia, is that a best practice as well? I think it could be depending on, you know, how many programs and how large the organization is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The budget resources uh, taken yeah. into consideration, right? Exactly. Okay, thank you. Are we ready to score? All right, please do so. Thank you. May I ask for two minutes? Um, it's you get ten, my friend. It is time. <laughs> Times five. Five of them. Good. It does five. Yeah, scores are in. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you at four sixteen. Awesome. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>
truth. Karen, um, are you back yet? I can't see. I'm here, Lindsay, but I don't think Karen is. This is Jim. I can see you. Hi, Jim. So Garrick's doing well there, huh? Garrick, Garrick is great. He is a go-getter. He's gonna do well. I mean, yes, he is. He's got the enthusiasm. That's the that's the key. Mm -hmm, exactly, and he's not afraid to ask the question. Yep. Yep. No, he is not. <laughs> awesome. Karen, I am scanning those documents you needed now. But how do you need me to send a voided check in the email? A voided check. Uh, for, for direct deposit or, do you, or just waive the direct deposit as I did and have them send the check to you. Please oh. do that. It's going to make it much faster. Oh, OK. I didn't click that option. And I, I forgot to give that uh, piece of advice. Thank you, Lindsay. And thank you, Jim. <laughs> One yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah, they don't they don't make the mail me a check option uh, prominent at all on that form. And and it takes them forever to uh, to do it, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, it could be wrong. I'm not going to have uh, uh, based upon the amount of money they're sending. <laughs> no, sadly, that has nothing to do with it. <laughs> um, OK. Uh, let me just check notes here. All right, I have 416, and um, I see everybody. Lindsay, I'm sorry that you're not seeing everybody. You've missed uh, Jim totally cracking up at various points, uh, <laughs> given some of your observations. Others as well, but uh, but Jim's was the biggest. <laughs> oh, good, oh, good. I guess, yeah. I, I'm <laughs> just imagine. Member. Good, thank imagine. you, I will, I'll imagine it. Oh, good, okay, great. <laughs> well, welcome back panelists. Um, Jan, are you with us too? I'm going to make sure we've got her before we kick off. Maybe we'll give her a few more seconds here. What, what's the order of the remaining pieces? I can't call up. For some reason, my, uh, my uh, schedule won't open. Yes, so uh, we have Folklore Village first, okay. then we have Woodland Pattern, okay. and then we have the Market Center for the Performing Arts in that okay. order. Right. Um, and as it happens, um, those are also sort of um, by budget size, which is curious. Um, so welcome back, panel. We are uh, now moving to other territory. We are in the uh, folk and traditional arts organization uh, discipline category. And our single applicant in this category is Folklore Village in Dodgeville. And they are a um, mid-sized organization. And off we go. Uh, Carrie, would you please start us off? I would love to. Thank you. Uh, Folklore Village, as you said, is in Dodgeville. Uh, its mission is to honor, experience, and support ethnic and traditional folk life. Um, uh, it was founded in 1966, but really um, became the village as an entity um, in 1993 when one of the early participants, um, Jane Farwell, deeded her family farm to the organization. So um, that's only, that's just a bit of a story, but it does, it, it offers five weekend events a year, um, school field trips, a folk school where uh, individuals can really get deep into um, a folk life practice. Um, it 
provides uh, social engagement for families and, and residents in the region um, with monthly bar dances. It has national association partnerships. So I can't remember exactly. The Hardanger Fiddle Association and the Squirrel Moon Country Dancers have their yearly gatherings at the site. They offer open mic um, offerings. They have free concert for seniors. So it's a wide variety of activity, really kind of a robust annual calendar. Um, so that's the, the, the big overview scope of what the organization does. I would say that in looking at, at what they are able to accomplish, um, it's, it's rich and it's deep. And like everywhere else, they had to make adjustments um, for the pandemic. But what I found most striking with their application is how much how much was included for their calendar coming up. And many, I mean, I know we're supposed to be looking reflectively um, and it, it does show that they have done quite a few things and they, um, but I think looking forward, they are taking their experiences from the pandemic early on and just translating it and, and shifting and showing that they have learned and moving forward. Um, so I can't but help but be impressed, <laughs> impressed with that. Um, their, their staff is, is exceptionally qualified to lead um, the, the programming at the site. And so that it is uh, worthy of note, the staff is very involved in public arts advocacy um, with the Wisconsin Arts Board. Um, there is 50% uh, of their income are donations and grants. So individuals, um, Support, support the place. They, it does give a really good, the application gives a really good detailed explanation of the variety of communities it serves. It serves a, a rural region of Wisconsin. So there's that audience. Um, it serves seniors for their concerts. It has a youth comp component and it serves those who want to really be deeply involved and folk arts and so and those students come from elsewhere maybe here but they come from all over with the folk life school a number of evaluation strategies were used to inform and plan and help the folk life village through this crisis and i think that's a key point in in their application is that in may they convened a a, a virtual town hall and invited stakeholders to really help and be part of, of the solution um, and work together to uh, navigate the pandemic um, road ahead. And so they were looking for an outside input and I think it's good to note um, in their, their application. Uh, I think, I also noted that they have a very thorough detailing of its marketing and public relations um, plan. So that's what that's what I have. Awesome. Thank you very much, Carrie. Lindsay. Great. Thanks, Carrie. I'm going to add on to that and sort of in reverse. Um, so I, I had that same note that I thought that the marketing plan was really good, based, especially for their budget size. Um, they are creative in finding low cost marketing strategies, which I applaud because I try to do that every day too. Um, and they, they specifically mentioned that in their new strategic plan, it was based on the, the community input. So those virtual town hall meetings, but just, uh, it's a, it wasn't just like bored. It sounds like they really reached out to the community, um, which doesn't happen very often. So that's great. I uh, want to echo what you said about um, the very qualified people that are working there. Um, they list that some of them are a part of the board of Folk Education Association of America. Um, and let's see. Yeah, the only other thing I had to add was, oh, I thought um, they are rebuilding their Norwegian log cabin by hand, which just sounds spectacular, but also <laughs> interesting. Um, but I applaud that. 
they they have done a lot of programming and i i guess i i had made a note that i'd like to know a little bit more about the quantity of the virtual opportunities that they're offering um and then just wanted to point out that beside they are producing programming as well as presenting um, and sometimes it's hard to do both so that is also great that's all i have thank you other comments For, for the past three years running, they have operated at almost exactly break even. I mean, with, with, within 50 cents of, of, of break. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, it's a remarkable uh, uh, record of, of understanding uh, your potential activities and, and how successful they're going to be and how much you have to invest in them. Um, the other thing that's remarkable, uh, that's different about this organization, in some ways this is similar to Ten Chimneys in that it is, it is an historic uh, uh, estate, if you will, although we call, we call estates where you grow things uh, farms. Um, it's an historic estate uh, that is being, is being repurposed from its original, uh, from its original activity. However, in this case, and this is not a value judgment, it's just a statement of fact, the mission came first. Uh, it was it, the, the, the farm girl who returned to the farm returned uh, as a folk artist, knowing that she wanted to establish a folk arts, uh, a, a folk arts center. And uh, I, think that, I, I think that colors everything that happens here. There's a consistency to what happens here uh, that is, is really very attractive. Um, it, it, like Ten Chimneys and Shake Rag Alley, however, uh, it's interesting when you look at the balance sheet of the organization that these buildings are about 75% depreciated. There's, there's almost no value left in the buildings themselves because they've been around for so long. Uh, essentially, the only thing that has value are the improvements that have been made to the buildings. Uh, it's a really interesting. Um, uh, it, it's it's an interesting accounting. I don't know whether problem, but accounting challenge for uh, for an organization that that manages historic facilities. Other comments. Providing again uh, the variance in their community. Um, like I really like seeing the blacksmith workshop and how they um, captioned it, saying it's a father and his eight-year-old son working together as a team. Uh, that was really wonderful. Thank you, Adalia. Jan, anything to add? Um, <clears throat> I, I'm known the organization for so long having lived in that area of the state uh, and, and just know the little pockets of the communities that they serve i think they've done just a remarkable um job of outreach and engagement of that rural community um in a very creative way and overcome a number of the challenges that they have within that that kind of 40 mile radius of, of service um it's a lot of empty land <laughs> Uh, right. But it, but then again, a number of the workshops just draw people from um, far field as well. So um, it's a, it's a, an interesting and unique setting, and uh, um, it has uh, you know sustained and and uh, flourished. So that's that's neat to see. Okay, thank you. Well then, let us score if there is no other comment to be made here.
All right, all the scores are here. Great, thank you. Okay then, uh, with another caution about whiplash, we are moving from the rural to the urban and we are um, heading to Woodland Pattern in Milwaukee. Jim, thank you. Woodland Pattern is a literary organization, which is oh, uh, thank you. fascinating right. in, a, in a variety of ways. Mid-sized literary organization with paid staff, although not paid enough uh, by, their, <laughs> by their, uh, their own presentation. Um, Woodland Pattern Book Center is dedicated to the discovery, cultivation, and presentation of poetry, independent literature, and the arts. A poet and artist-run nonprofit book center, education forum, gallery, and performance space located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin's River West neighborhood. A space to gather, study, perform, exchange ideas, build relationships across racial, generational, and other perceived barriers. For 40 years, it's been presenting an internationally celebrated artists alongside performances by local and regional writers, artists, and musicians. Uh, delivers activity to all age groups. Uh, it it um, has been uh, it it exists in one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the country, housing a balance of African American, white, and Latinx people. And um, the numbers are astounding. This is a bookstore, friends, and the numbers <laughs> are astounding. Four hundred thirteen artists, eighteen thousand two hundred thirty-four adults, three hundred children. 350 events, a poetry marathon in January, gala in November, literary arts programming, music programming, film programming, youth and adult education programming. And uh, since April 1st, after pivoted with COVID, they have been uh, putting out prompts against anxiety through their, uh, through their uh, virtual uh, uh, channels. Uh, the Big Read, they distributed 500 free books and engaged 1,200 Milwaukeeans. And for youth, they have been delivering weekly creative writing packets, packets and created a summer youth poetry camp. And now they're uh, working on virtual programming for schools. Um, they have three, they're, they're 11, they have six full-time staff members, 11 board members, and their committees are governance, fundraising and anti-racism um it's uh it is a remarkable organization uh in a whole bunch of ways and let me just quickly see if i have anything on the next page very clear budget page explanation i appreciated that and i'm going to stop talking now <laughs> thank you uh, clearly more than a book store awesome <laughs> lindsay uh, yes, I was very impressed with this organization as well. I had not, I was not familiar with them before reading these applications, and it sounds like they're doing great work. Uh, I have in my notes that they moved all educational programs to Zoom and initiated new programs, like the one um, John, uh, sorry, Jim mentioned, Prompts Against Anxiety, um, and I think that that's very impressive. Um, they redesigned their website and have, I don't know if they created the online book center or just um, enhanced it, but I made that note as well. Um, uh, they've had a rise in giving since 2018, so their support's continuing to grow. And uh, also I made a note of, of the anti-racism committee because I haven't seen that on a lot of boards, that's great. Um, and I thought that I think that their offerings reflect the demographic that they serve. Um, participate in community events and forums. Uh, they are the fiscal receiver for three other organizations. The founding memory, m the founding member of a poetry coalition. And uh, I thought their strategic plan was thorough, a good marketing plan. Um, and yeah, overall, I think that they're doing stellar work. Great, thank you. You're missing the nods. Jan, <laughs> Dahlia, Carrie, anything to add to that, please? No, it is just anecdotal. Um, one, I appreciated learning about them, and that's one of the big benefits of serving on this panel. But I also, again, I, 
I, I guess I really appreciate the, 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 the anecdotal evidence that applicants use to support their um, applications. I just really love Stacy Simaczek. I, 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 I don't know, there's a quote um, that, that she said, and I would dig it up, but um, look it up. It, it was a great quote. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Will do. Jen? Oh, I'm, I'm just like, um, you know, I'm, I'm only nodding just uh, in affirmation of all the other comments that have been said uh, in total agreement. It's, a, it's a, an amazing organization, how it's grown, how it's um, leveraged its p position in the community is um, just remarkable. Um, <laughs> just knowing how it uh, got started, it's really fun to uh, see the evolution of these organizations over time and uh, what they offer in the community. And um, as, <clears throat> as a rich literary resource, um, it really um, has um, branched out with with so many um, meaningful programs. So um, great organization and um, need to see where it's where where it's come. So thank you. Adalia? Yeah, it's just I agree with everything. I just it's so wonderful um, the relevance they provide to the community. All right. I, I love the uh, the fact that they Amplify voices across identities and emphasize intergenerational program. Thank you for calling that quote out. Okay, please score. Okay, back to the initial review. Which one shall I pick? All the scores are in. Okay. So, Jim, I'm sorry. Did you ask? I was sidetracking. Did you ask a question? No, no. I, I, I made a frivolous comment. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let that be the intro to the last of our applications. Um, we have moved into the world of presenting organizations, and uh, this is a large budget organization uh, that pays its artists in, uh, in Milwaukee, the Marcus Center for the Performing Arts. And Jim, you are starting us off. Righty. The Marcus Center acts as an energizing force that connects our community to the world through collaboration, innovation, social engagement, and the transformative power of live performing arts. It's uh, located in Milwaukee. Its budget is $14 million. It is a presenting organization. Uh, it began its life in 1969 as the uh, uh, Milwaukee County Performing Arts Center. Uh, in 1994, it was renamed because of a large gift for its renovation from the Marcus family, and it uh, and in 1997, it w the refurbished center opened. Um, it is the home of a number of well-known uh, performing arts organizations that are uh, housed in Mil or that are are based in Milwaukee, including at the moment the Milwaukee Symphony, although it's moving away to to its new facility, which is going to open up some new programming time. Uh, in Eline Hall, the, the major hall in uh, in the Marcus Center, uh, the focus the focus of the uh, of the application is on the Marcus Center's activity uh, without those programs with uh, without those programs that are brought by the producing organizations, and without the touring Broadway programs. It, the focus is the their niche programming that fills in the gaps uh, among uh, among the uh, the uh, the locally based uh, producing organizations. So it says as a presenter, the Marcus Center offers its own diverse arts and entertainment programming to our entire community, 
to build bridges through shared cultural experiences. So their activity, although you've got the big performing arts that's very traditional in its own way, they try to offer non-traditional niche programming that fills the gaps both in the use of the facilities and in uh, the experiences for audiences. Uh, the center is also home to a oh, the residence artists. I've already said that. Um, 500 artists, 400,000 adults, 200,000 children, 150 plus events, plus the resident companies and the Broadway tour uh, activity. Um, the series offer offerings include MC, that is Marcus Center Presents, live at PEC, which is their outdoor venue, Kids Days at the Center, which is their, uh, their youth program, and Off-Broadway at Marcus Center, which is smaller theatrical activities. A National Geographic film series, and, uh, film and lecture series, and additional presented series from the resident part, uh, partners. And then they also program uh, international, internationally renowned performing arts activities, uh, largely concert uh, presentations uh, to present throughout the world to supplement the programming. Uh, center strives to be a bridge between cultures and an energizing force for collaboration and advocacy in the community, curating a diverse range of performing artists in each season to ensure that the arts being presented represent the community we serve. Uh, it is interesting to note that uh, when the programming team was called out by name, it was not only the director of programming who was on it, uh, it was the director of community engagement and inclusivity as well. Um, 28 full time, uh, before COVID, there were 28, uh, I'm sorry, after COVID, there are 28 full time staff members and eight part time staff members. Before COVID, there were 43 full time, 151 part time. Uh, the venues are closed because you can't afford the, the, the acts of that size unless you can fill the house with ticket buyers. Um, they had great diverse seasons in 2017 to 2019, and thanks to them for, uh, for calling those out. Uh, they have an outstanding professional staff, board committees, uh, community partner organizations of all ethnicities. Um, while they are closed, they are renovating Eline Hall, and, um, and they are creating a new outdoor public space that can host uh, performance activity, and they are enhancing their cleaning practices throughout the facility so that they can welcome people back as early as, uh, as possible. Uh, $59 million in economic impact in 2019, 2020, even though 2020 finished three months early. Uh, so that's pretty amazing. 200,000 support for small and ethnic performing organizations. Their strategic plan is, in, in, uh, in two phrases, embrace change and serve all people. I'm sorry. Did you say that's their strategic plan or their, that's, their, that's, their, that's their trajectory? They, 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 he referred to that as, or in the, in the, uh, in the text, it was referred to as our strategic plan, is to embrace change and to serve all people. Thank you. Adalia. Yeah, that was a great story. Um, I guess just filling in even some more of the gaps, it was nice to read about their music and movies programming with the rooftop um, being a space where you could enjoy all of that art and also view the city. Um, their Kids Days at Home program they had 47,000 views, and their activity books um, were really published in English and Spanish. Um, so I thought that was great. Um, it seemed like they had really strong leadership, and I'm glad they took the initiative in 2017 to work with the P3 Development Group, um, specifically for community engagement and inclusion, inclusion study. Um, I think I'd like to see even more about how they uh, took to heart those recommendations on how they can kind of continue to remove barriers and kind of change the perception of what it is and what it can be um, for presenting. Thank you. Other comments? Mm. 
None, none here. Okay, thank you. Um, and Jim, maybe you can help answer this. I, with their supporting budget documents, really struggled to find anything that matched. I couldn't find 2019 and 2020. They were all older than that. Yes, they were. I couldn't find anything later than 17. Uh, and that that was difficult. Yeah. Uh, they gave us several versions of 2017, a couple of six month <laughs> plans, uh, which were hard to uh, hard to decipher. They they were consistent in scale with the budget uh, with the budget activity that they showed us uh, on the form, but there were no matching numbers because they were for the wrong years. Yeah. Okay. Then my only other thing, uh, they're they're doing great work. I'm familiar with the organization. I respect and love what they do, and I love to visit as often as I can um, because the quality is is always so great. Um, I think in general with the grant applications, especially for, well, I think any sized organization, it is it is helpful to sort of get that initial snapshot in the narrative. And maybe that's part of the questions and something we should just discuss later. But um, they list what the events are that they do and they list an overall total. But I kind of like to see how how many Broadway series do they have? What How many in this MC presents? What's the live at PEC? The kids, they list all of those things, but they didn't really go into detail. The supporting documents helped to a certain extent, but even the brochure was, the brochure helped with the numbers, but then the brochure didn't say like, okay, so the, the kids days activities are, and then like kind of listing a little in a little bit more detail. I, I felt like I know of this organization, but if I didn't have any information coming into this grant, I would be wondering what some of these things are. That's all. One of the fun facts buried in the information was that uh, there are two 20,000 subscribers to the performance uh, to the performances uh, or to the seasons of the resident companies and the Broadway activity. And that doesn't include uh, the Milwaukee Symphony that's moving out. Those 20,000 performance subscribers are more season ticket holders than either the Milwaukee Bucks or the Milwaukee Blues have. So when we get to the evaluation portion of this, um, the, which is momentarily, it would be helpful to talk a little bit about what kind of what kind of format that snapshot might entail that would be really helpful to you and you know simple enough for applicants to um, encapsulate. So thank you for that. Um, did anybody have any comment about their actual strategic plan, which was um, attached and and quite comprehensive? No is fine. Just curious. All righty. If you are if you are done with the conversation, then thank you and please score. Oops. All the scores are here. Awesome. Dale, thank you for doing your magic. How much time will you need? Oh, five, five to ten, somewhere in there. I think. Okay. Well then, um, if, if you all, uh, first of all, just want to give yourselves a massive hand and, uh, <laughs> and congratulate yourself for a remarkable day and remarkable weeks that led up to today. You have done uh, beyond yeoman's work <laughs> in this process. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, does, do you just want to stretch for a minute before we uh, before we get back into stuff? Uh, I got it. Yes. 
just do that. Yes. Stand, stand up stretch. We have gone through the entire um, sunrise, sunset experience here, and I am back to the electric lights that I began with uh, earlier today. Holy cow. And I would uh, love to pick your brains on a little bit. Since we had a, a break about you know, a half hour or so ago, um, are you guys good to just kind of continue into the conversation? All right, great. Marvelous. Uh, and I, I asked the question knowing that, uh, that you may well be somewhat brain dead, and that's perfectly understandable. So uh, we can extract what we can extract. Um, I do have some leading questions, but first of all, just uh, off the top of your heads, on top, uh, at the forefront of your minds, um, anything you wanna bring up or talk about about today before I ask you a formal evaluation question? I am welcoming comments on, we are welcoming comments on everything from the, the application uh, review process, uh, the application form, Jim has his hand up. What do you got? <laughs> yes. I, I, have, I have called up uh, uh, one of the forms so that I have this information correct. Thank you. On the activity summary page, okay. the last sentence of this, the box that is headed adults engaged in person ages 18 and over reads do not double count people who were repeat attendees that is an absurd statement and so we have told the nea <laughs> I mean, until until we we insert chips into everybody's forearm <laughs> and, and have chip readers at every performing arts venue. Uh, there is no way accurately to discount by season ticket holders and repeat performers. There simply isn't. So whatever whatever number is, appears in that field is going to be somebody's wild ass guess, unless they have a series of six events in a 200 seat hall. Uh, which is entirely filled by season ticket holders, and none of them bring Granny one week and and uh, and and Aunt, ha Aunt Hazel the next. So it is simply an absurd number, and it it therefore is not comparable. Doesn't allow us to compare. Um, uh, Real numbers. Doesn't allow us to compare organizations one to another in any way. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. I have not had it called out in quite that way, in quite so clear a way before, and uh, I am more than delighted to uh, to bring that up again um, to our friends because, yes, what you said. Okay. So you want you want me to talk about budget now? My other my other problem. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, here is the problem. The problem is word number six under average revenue. Okay, this is on on the budget page. Uh, you have the you have the three years of operating budget with the green line. Then you have average revenue, and the next statement says explain how any surplus or debt came to be and how you have dealt will deal deal with it. Debt and deficit are different. Okay. Debt means you have you owe somebody else money. And the organizations are looking at this and they're saying, I haven't had to borrow money to cover this deficit. Therefore, I am not in debt. Therefore, I do not have to put any explanation down here. Hey, George, given your experience with Pennsylvania, if you want to jump in on this, if you have any context, it would be welcome. But if not, that's perfectly fine. Um, I'm appreciating the distinguishing uh, that you just did, Jim. Yeah, and I, I think um, given the what we're asking there, which is essentially 
tell us why you've lost so much money and we should still give you money or why you made so much money and we should still give you money. I think Jim's clarification is a good one. And the other piece in, on this page, so 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 what what it should say is explain how any surplus or deficit came to be. One way of doing that is to add a fourth field above, which is an automatic field that uh, that shows the difference between uh, revenue and expense, and and make the requirement if there is a negative, if there is a you know put put a put a, a number in there that says, if there is a number in this field that's larger than X, please explain. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Uh, the other thing on this page is in kind. People should need to uh, explain what in kind, what they mean by in kind. Where would you find it most helpful to find that information, that kind of breakdown on of in-kind contributions? On this page. You know, just, just tell me the tell me the three major factors in in-kind. Is it donated is it donated hours by volunteers that are cached uh, and put in the here, here's what my, here are several ways that it might happen. I apologize, I'm running on caffeine now. <laughs> <laughs> Here are several ways that it might uh, that 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 factor becomes a problem or becomes an issue. Yeah. Uh, there is one school of thought that says you should value your uh, your volunteers' hours, convert those into dollars, and show those an ex as an expense, and then show on the on the revenue side in kind support that matches it and cancels it out. If you're doing that, then you are very likely to be running a deficit because you will have you will have created non-cash liabilities on your expense side that you are then going to balance with your um, uh, balance with with your in-kind support. Uh, same thing with um, uh, same thing with donated facilities or owned facilities. Do you charge yourself rent? And then do you cancel out the rent by by not charging yourself by by showing um, by showing a payment by showing revenue uh, as in kind? And many organizations do that in order to achieve a budget match. That's one way of achieving a budget match. Thank you. So uh, sort of a mini little in-kind budget uh, table for them to fill out with some generalities and then maybe some other uh, fill in the blank thing. And the other thing to ask is uh, this may be this may be the issue. Um, do the figures above reflect uh, depreciation in kind? Do the expense figures above uh, reflect depreciation or in kind do the revenue numbers above reflect use of reserve funds or endowment income and that would clear up a whole bunch of the confusion uh, about the numbers in that in that table that's well said Jim, do you feel like knowing about unearned revenue would be helpful? Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Is unearned income not differentiated so within the the budget that you all see? It almost always is. It it shows as fund fundraising income or or something else. And believe me, that's a terrible uh, that's a terrible name for it because you earn every dime. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well said. Well said. Okay, good. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Awesome. Other thoughts on things that were consistently irritating or things that were consistently lovely or things that were just consistently catching your attention? I'll shut up now. For organizations that had a definite schedule of programming, um, I found it um, really helpful when they identified their schedule. 
and um, kind of went through um, that in an in organized fashion rather than um, just putting it all into a, a flowing narrative of some sort that I had to sort of wade through and um, really try to figure out what they did over the course of the year uh, and and uh, how this was implemented. Some people um, included uh, program schedules in their supplemental materials or, or you could find it in a newsletter or you could find it in an annual report and some didn't at all. And so I found myself going back and forth to the narratives, uh, really trying to look for the continuity of the organization. So um, it just took a lot of time, sometimes invested in, in wading through some of that material. So you have right up front. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Lindsay, to have that right up front and that kind of a, a continuity snapshot of programming. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you if you put on fifteen exhibitions, give me an idea of what what those exhibitions are. Um, if you put on X number of performing programs um, over a period of time, give me the time period um, what those entailed, and certainly in a nutshell, if there are any supplementary programs that go along with that, um, trying to weed through all of that so you know how it works um it is, is a little cumbersome um i believe there was one organization that you called out um as uh doing it really really well was that was that the photo uh the center for photography in madison oh or i thought was that a different one i yeah i thought that they broke down each I think that's the one that I remember. Okay. They broke down each type of activity that they do. Mm -hmm. And like, so they listed the amount of those activities, but then explained what it was. Um, I thought it was organized very well. I agree that when it's just like this one really long paragraph, it's a lot harder to um, hold on to that information when you're reading so many grants and when it can just be broken down more clearly. In a, in a similar way, when, when we were all like, when you're the first reader and we were talking about each group, we sort of did did that work of summarizing what they put in that long paragraph. Um, it's not to say that that information isn't great. It's just maybe not organized as simply as it could be. Okay, thank you. Sorry to jump on, on you, Jan. I was agreeing with you. No, no, that's all right. Uh, you're missing the reassuring smiles, Lindsay. All righty. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be your interpreter. <laughs> Audio description, RS. Um, other thoughts for you all and from you all about any aspect of this? Um, I'm not looking at them both in front of me right now, but I the we both have the same four main questions, but the sub questions. So the sub questions that we're grading on are, are what we're looking for versus sometimes the sub questions of what they're answering. Sometimes they meshed really well, but I but I, I found myself wondering if it was just a I don't want to say poorly written grant because I, I out of everybody, I wouldn't say anyone was anyone did a really horrible job, but um, some people really excelled at ticking off all the boxes and answering all of the questions that we had. But um, so I guess I don't have a very concrete or more detailed thing than that, but I, I found myself going back and forth between what they were answering, what we were grading on, and then I even like made my own little like abbreviated um, points of what I was looking for just to make sure I wasn't missing anything. Am I the only one that had that? Yeah, no, sorry. I forget that you, you don't see or not. <laughs> uh, no, no, Lindsay, I definitely agree that especially early on, I, I was having a hard time trying to figure out how to evaluate um, and then trying to even find what they were actually answering <laughs> compared right. to what I was supposed to be using as a, a marker. Yeah, um, we, I'm going to, I'll triple check, but we're pretty good at double checking that what you have on your criteria and comment sheets are what they have on there. Here are the sub pieces to respond to within this larger question. So we really try to make those parallel. Um, 
but I will make sure that that is still the case. Um, last I checked, it was. Sometimes it very well could be that they just weren't responding to, um, you know, for example, some people gave their last three year history. Some someone gave more than that. Someone just gave their last year. So that was kind of across the board. And so so I know that I, from what the what their questions were, that they were supposed to give the last three years and then what they're currently doing in COVID. And so it was just kind of across the board if that whether that was done or not. And you as panelists get to you know, reflect your response to that, uh, whether they adhere to the questions we asked them to answer or not in your scoring. I mean, that's where you get to say, this was way too much work, no, or wow, the nuggets were here and yes. I mean, it's- Well, that's, that's why I can't remember what you're gonna consistent, say. Right, as long I'm as you're consistent. That, um, where I said it looked like a copy paste of their marketing promo, yeah. um, it was, <laughs> Wait, like, I don't need to know what time your event happened no. at, <laughs> but yeah. But what's um, hard on, on the other hand is like, is knowing that there's so much great work. I, there were several times where I was like, wow, this organization, I know they're doing really great work, but they're not really great at grant writing. Yeah, yeah. And those that have uh, people on staff who can do that and have a background in that, and those that have, you know, six volunteers working on the application. Yeah. And so you know, it's assumed that you take that into context as well. Um, and, and that's part of the orientation that we did early on, which is consider the context and consider where the organization is and its access to resources and all that good stuff. Right. Hey, Dale, are you, uh, do you have the numbers yet for us? I do. Awesome. Would you, um, would you please, do you have everybody's email addresses? Otherwise, email it to me and I will email it out to everybody so they can see it in their own um, computers. But I will also ask you to share a screenshot um, uh, unless emailing it to everybody is just ridiculously onerous, in which case just uh, share your screen and we'll go from there. Okay. Um, let me try and save it in a way that will be easier. Okay. I do want to say that... that um, this was a remarkably high quality group of applicants. Uh, I, I, I did not find anybody that I thought, yes, or is, is, is this applicant worthy? And in all other uh, pools that I've been a part of, uh, there were at least one or two where I had to think hard about, about whether or not it was a good idea to pass them on. Yeah, and, Jim, and just to that, I came on that. I I just found it uh, really exciting to see um, so much very cool work being done around the state, um, large and small. Uh, really made me want to get out and find out more about these organizations <laughs> and, and try to visit every one of them. Let's get a I, bus go on a road trip. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah, um, and and the fact that they managed to uh, develop these proposals in a time when the world is just swirling um, <laughs> on so many levels uh, is astoundingly uh, impressive. Dan, I just saw your circle change. I can keep talking. Maybe you can just interrupt me. When you um, are, so I just emailed you the PDF and I can share it as well if you like. Yes, that would be lovely. Thank you. Um, I will tell you that what you will see, you guys, is the rough. These are the rough numbers. We will parse them out into their individual categories. Right now, you're going to see a mix of the visual arts organizations and the multidisciplinary organizations and the literary and the folk and presenters. <laughs> Um, we will uh, pull them out into subcategories down the road, but we wanted to share with you right now what it is that we have. So there we go. Uh, can anybody see that? <laughs> That's like, it is so small, Dale. There's no flipping way. <laughs> That's better. That's better. Oh, better. Thank you. <laughs> I feel much better now. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and this, uh, this is also a way for us to let uh, the observers who have uh, been patiently and probably um, with deep interest uh, following this conversation and who are still on the line, they can also see uh, what it is that you have brought. So let's take a moment 
and just go through that. When you when you need Dale to scroll down further, um, please let him know. But right now, we'll just let you sit with what you can see above the 32 line. I have to say that I am really struck by the fact that in the first four, um, app, the four highly scored applications, we have one from each of the disciplinary, which is right. beyond cool. That's very cool. And each of the sizes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Rural and urban. The, the whole matrix is represented in the in the top four. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 